And uh, welcome back to everybody. We're gonna move right along to our next keynote presentation now. And I'm super excited to introduce Thomas Huang, who is with the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. He's gonna be talking about the importance of building a community rather than a castle. So without taking up any more of his time, thank you, Thomas, so much for joining us. And I will step off stage now. All right. Thank you, Rich. Let me get my screen going here. All right, so um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to uh, this uh, uh, conference. Uh, I've been looking forward to, uh, actually I've been looking forward to come to uh, New Orleans uh, for a while, uh, but then again, 2020 is a very unique year for all of us. Uh, but uh, thank, uh, thanks to technology, uh, we still managed to get the community going and still communicate and being stay productive. So as uh, Rich mentioned, I work at the JPL. I've been here for more than two decades. Uh, been, um, some of the things that we've been doing, uh, as you know, many of you probably heard, JPL is very famous for the Mars rover. Uh, obviously, we're doing more than the Mars rover. Uh, we have been working on a variety of uh, missions. Um, and this is actually, I managed uh, a pretty large team at the JPL, uh, mainly doing development uh, for to supporting all these uh, uh, planetary and also Earth science missions. Um, so just give you a little bit of background on the, some of the challenges we've been dealing with at JPL. And actually, in, it's not just JPL, but in general uh, for um, our uh, space missions. Um, we noticed this that um, uh, you know, as the instruments are getting more advanced, uh, we're actually collecting much more data, a lot more data than before. And you can look at this uh, di the picture here on the upper right. You know, the currently we generate one of the missions is we generating about 48, uh, 485 gigabytes of data per day. Uh, the ones that we're going to be launching next year is going to be 17 terabyte, and the following year is going to be 86 terabyte. This is per day. Um, now, this is just one mission. Okay, and we are looking at uh, in the next year and beyond, we are looking at petabyte scale uh, missions. And as we start uh, moving to the new era, uh, we are looking at uh, doing smarter, uh, rather than just collecting lots of data, what can we um, um, creating a solution where we can doing uh, basically is a, uh, a whole life cycle of data, right? Can we do some smarts on board, uh, do some analysis? Because some of the, if you, you know, let's say you launch something to the Mars. Uh, well, it take data it takes at least 15 minutes to get back to Earth, right? So what happened? You missed something important, right? So we want to be able to do some really smart uh, onboard analysis and be able to capture the information um, well, and, and, and not just waiting for the data to downlink. And maybe we missed up uh, the, the opportunity. We're also looking at how to uh, be smarter in terms of uh, managing our ground stations where we can actually uh, 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 prioritize uh, data collections. And more, more importantly, we have massive data archives. Uh, and the, basically is this is where, you know, the science actually happens. So uh, this is a, a chart that I got from our uh, NASA uh, sponsored uh, in, for those of you who do not know a lot about NASA, uh, we don't just have one big archives. Uh, uh, we actually have a, a, just for the earth science side of things, we actually have distributed archives across the, the nation. Um, and this is on the, the picture on the right is really the, the all the you know, uh, data centers. Um, and the one that's on the left is where we've seen the challenge here, right? This is, uh, we're in 2020 right now. We are somewhere, uh, you know, collectively, we have, um, you know, almost around 50 petabytes of data, but we are looking at getting to hundreds of petabyte data within the next few years, right? This is just for NASA itself. And, um, and come back to here, these archives are distributed across, so they don't have, we don't have a centralized uh, 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 location for this. And if you want to look at this chart again, is that um, you have, uh, these are on the left side, is just all the Earth science missions that currently we're uh, and in the near uh, future we'll be flying. Um, 
in the NASA alone, and if you look at is um, if you take any kind of a climate uh, science class or just general earth science class, they would, they would tell you that uh, when you look at climate research, we can just look at one parameter. Let's say you know the the um, the, the level of the ocean, right? Well, great if it's rising. What is affecting to that? What's attribute to that? What are the factors? Uh, if there's a hurricane happening, well, what are different variables that's playing along? These are different physical variables. So it's not just a one measurement and you will get all the answers. Uh, it's a really integrated science uh, and just to, so that you can get the whole picture. Um, and uh, it's also combining data from different kinds of measurements and different kinds of spatial and temporal uh, resolutions. This is just earth science alone within uh, NASA, but think about globally, Right, we have a global community. The other nations, other agencies, are also flying uh, their own satellite, collecting their own measurement, which our science uh, community also would like to have access to. So this is pretty, give you a little perspective here. This is just one parameter that we have been uh, collecting. Uh, this is measuring the uh, the sea level uh, over about over two decades, and this animation is actually um, is collecting um, uh, base. Um, you know, see how things are evolving over time. If you look at the chart on your over uh, lower right, you see the, the sea level is rising. Uh, this is not fabricated data. This is just data that we collected and we just plot the information. Um, so um, actually, if you take a closer look at this picture, I can you know, hear the picture, you know, hear the music and inception playing in the background. Uh, so, but again, this is just uh, one parameter, all right? Um, but if you take a, take a step back, look at uh, something like hurricane analysis, right? When you look at uh, something like uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, we actually just look at the little diagram, um, the box that right in the middle here. Um, um, there's various factors that you have to look at in the hurricane. You have to look at the wind, you have to look at the rain, you have to look at the uh, the, the tide. Um, and how does, how does the scientist can quickly understand how these parameters are playing together? And they are not sitting together. Remember, we have distributed archive across the uh, United States. Um, but this tool we actually build is to actually allow us to quickly, you know, on the fly, uh, compare the um, the rain and also the the sea surface temperature um, interactively. And if you if you just take a this look at this picture here, the little light green uh, light blue line here is the rise of the precipitation or the rain, and then you see the drop of the sea sea surface temperature. Right. This is something we can do now on the fly, interactively using um, you know, the, the solution that we've been developing. Uh, come back to this one too, where you look at uh, anomaly in the ocean. Uh, some of the, this is some of the, the well-documented uh, event where there was this uh, warming um, over at the uh, coast of Alaska um, that causes huge impact to the marine life. Um, and it's anomaly because they don't know what's going on, what's causing it. And this uh, solution, allow, uh, the tool that you're looking at, allows to quickly generate the, the plot for the anomaly on the ocean uh, in terms of the temperature. And the scientists can actually select where's the peaks, and you can they can also overlay different uh, other measurements, and they can change the, the opacity of the data uh, to, to look at what's underneath, because you can stack the information. And then you can play the animation as you can see the little area that I selected is starting turning red, right? This is where we, it's such a well-known uh, uh, anomaly that actually called the uh, the Pacific Bob. Uh, it caused huge uh, marine uh, death right under, right here. This is documented this, uh, the whales, uh, this, this death, and this is these a bunch of bears that are eating the, the, the carcass of the, the fin whale. So we have tools that allow us to do this now on the fly. Um, and same thing here. Think about I live in California. We have uh, right now we have lots of fires, uh, but we also have time that we have rains, and we want to measure how the, the the effects of the precipitation and also how the rivers are operating. And this little charts here is really give us the summary of the ten uh, big rivers in Southern California, and then we can overlay that with the satellite observation. Um, for precipitation, and you can see how they dance together, right? You see the little blue line here, this is the ma massive rainfall, and then you can follow by the massive uh, river discharge, which is the red line here, right? Uh, we can, this is actually give scientists the tool and the solution where they quickly uh, see how these, some of these 
physical observation that we can collect through a uh, satellite and also compare that with subsurface measurement right under uh, the river. Now, for those of you who do not know about how uh, science works, so this is how you mix sausages, right? In the past, the um, scientists actually had to go to the da data archive. They have to search for the data they want. They download the data. Um, that, that could be depends on the size of the data that they want, like the, the windows. And then they have to basically carve out most of the data as a global scale data. So they might be just collecting, like carve out a piece of that individual file. Uh, just be the size of the file and the number of file varies. Um, then they have to provide the, uh, um, the computation to generate the statistic for individual chunks of the data that they computed, and then they overlay them together, right? That's a lot of work. Um, and that's fine when you have small amount of data, but think about it, you have petabyte scale data, right? It turns out IO has become the biggest uh, challenge. Um, what we have been looking at for the last few years is that, well, well, why don't, this is a really cool thing about, um, then Apache, uh, uh, we did, we start looking at Hadoop and then we start switch to Spark, right? Um, by taking the data, the earth science data that we have collected to the satellite, we chunk it up by small tiles, store them into some kind of a, a NoSQL database like Cassandra, right? Uh, and then we index those data through spatial indexes through these things like Apache Solar. And then when somebody selects a region, we can just pull the chunks that relevant to that locations and then and then run them uh, or compute them on our Spark cluster, right? Just creating a bunch of RDDs, right? So that's essentially what we have done. Um, and um, the, the result is basically, is amazing, right? Uh, the, this is a traditional method. Uh, when we did a quick comparison on traditional method of analysis, it takes about 20 minutes uh, to compute, uh, analyze a you know, small 2.6 gigabyte of data, right? Uh, but using these, the uh, our solutions, uh, which is building based on Apache uh, solutions, um, took us about two seconds uh, to compute, and that's volume. Now we are we're talking about you know doing some real science here, where you can do interactively rather than doing batch oriented solutions. So we created this the Apache uh, S app um, over the last few years. Uh, is being uh, is a is a platform we call it an analytic center platform. Um, and the whole idea here is to provide a, a harmonized environment where scientists can go in and just, just basically compare different kind of uh, parameters or analysis uh, together without having to figure out how to download and, and, and slice the data and we project the data and all that. Uh, they don't have to do that. They just use simple REST service APIs. Uh, the workflow is really pulling the data through the archives, um, store it in the cloud-based analysis storage, and then create web services on top of that. And these are where the scientific algorithms are uh, being managed. And then we expose them to simple web service API so that you can create GIS applications. Uh, you can create you know, using Jupyter Notebook. And we also supported the, the S3's ArcGIS. Um, the solution to so far been evolving over time uh, because we are working for dif uh, different projects. They have different budgets. They have different needs. Not everybody's going to run on the cloud, which I like them to, but they also have their own hardware. Right? So we create a system as, as an architecture where uh, it's created uh, based on the facade of web service API. So you can run this in uh, uh, on-prem cluster or on private cloud or Amazon. Um, it's really based on the requirement on the project and the kind of data they uh, they need. Uh, but again, to the user for these applications is completely transparent. They have no idea uh, well, where this thing is actually running. And just like, you know, you never had to take a cloud computing class when you sign up for Gmail, right? So same idea. So we really looking at creating a platform that enable collection of tools um, and rather than just creating like, here's a killer app, I looked at a very nice shiny application. You wanna create a system where you can actually build these application on top of that, where we can really allow scientists to explore the data. And to the point where you can actually have full blown um, GIS application running on uh, your browser or on your phone. Right. This is actually something I like because uh, I, I travel a lot and I actually test our own application while I'm waiting for my uh, my flight. And so I test it on my phone and I find some bugs and I take a screenshot and text it to my uh, my engineer and say, hey, look at what I found. 
it's actually been very productive. I've been actually being the uh, major tester of this application. Um, but the cool thing about this is that you can actually generate analysis, you can do animation, you can jump to different uh, period uh, because we have the speed uh, to do uh, and the architecture allows us to do that. So I come from a background where I can do, uh, I've been doing a lot of technology research. Um, you know, great, you know, I'm, involved, I'm actually a principal investigator of various uh, big data project in NASA. Uh, it's, there's a, always a gap between the technology research and technology infusion because you can build something really cool really fast, but the problem is that the project may not have the funding uh, or they just say, well, the cost is too much to operate in the cloud because the, the growth of the data. Uh, and another thing is some of the uh, real sludges making in operation is that, well, what happens if we shut down part of the system? Or how do we onboard new data without taking things off, offline? Uh, how do you manage the priority of the jobs? Um, so those are the things that actually really uh, um, um, a real questions uh, for running uh, science mission because you know, in, in science archives. And uh, we can just say wipe everything and restart everything, right? Because you're talking about massive amount of data. Um, so, um, so we are looking at building solution, but not just make it out there and say, hey, you know, this is really cool, but really looking at, well, how would people use this in operationally and what are their needs? Uh, and how do they, uh, um, you know, given my background is actually working you know, supporting flight mission, for over the last 20 years. Uh, those are the things that this really site engineer may not think about. They just really think about, well, let's get how what we can do with GPU. Look at what we have done with uh, uh, Spark. But we had, some of the subtle question we really have to think about is, well, when somebody have to run this, uh, they really have to figure out how to uh, keep the system moving without shutting everything off. So we this is why we opened up uh, Apache uh, SDAP or Science Data Analytic Platform. Um, and uh, actually, we started the, the open source actually started in the 2017, but we've been, there's a history of this uh, evolution of this technology. Uh, we actually started working on the, uh, uh, how to analyze the uh, satellite data um, starting back in as early as 2011. And we were using Nebula. And if you, you owe enough, you know what Nebula is, right? Um, it's our little uh, private cloud uh, solution to, that NASA was trying to build. Um, and we, we, at that point, uh, we didn't have Spark yet, right? It was too early. So we used a Hadoop and used HBase. Uh, we tried to use the point cloud and it was great. We were able to do some, uh, you know, and analyze, you know, decades of data, uh, but we had to do some kind of batch oriented processing for it. Uh, that was, that shows like, okay, great, but it's just point clouds too expensive to do for satellite data. Um, and we start evolving over time. Uh, to really move to 2014, where we start taking at the ideas of, well, why do we tile this stuff up? Why do we chunk it up so that we can actually use this uh, uh, really cool thing about Apache uh, Spark, where we can actually run this up in memory, and all I need is just a you know cluster with high memories in there. Um, so that's what we did in 2014. We got you know uh, three big projects, and then we also established the NASA Sea Level Change Portal, uh, which is one is the NASA's official response to the rise of the ocean, uh, where we can allow scientists to do indirectly uh, analyze different um, parameters uh, uh, related to rise, uh, sea level rise. And then, uh, of course, in 2017, we got our approval to JPL to open source this stuff, and immediately we uh, we established the SDAP because recognizing that we just don't have the bandwidth to maintain this on our own. Uh, we also know that we have expertise on doing lots of ocean stuff, but what about the other parameter? We really want the other community to contribute uh, uh, to, the, to the algorithms. How do we support uh, uh, different kinds of data format? Uh, and open source is actually allow us to, um, you know, keep this thing moving as at the same time, I can go do something fun. Right, so uh, that's the whole point. If we just ho hang on to our technology, then that technology will die eventually. So um, anyway, so this is our uh, SDAP website. Uh, it's been twenty, been about three years now. Right, uh, we actually moving to the point where we support um, uh, 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 in situ data matchups, which is measuring comparing satellite data with a subsurface measurement on the fly. Uh, we supporting things like ArcGIS integrations. Uh, we're doing things like uh, Kubernetes uh, deployments. And um, 
one thing that uh, you don't know about JPL, uh, you know, everybody think NASA is like, well, that is NASA, right? Everything has to be, you know, private, top secret. Um, well, this, yes, true. We, but that's a process that we do, and and um, and JPL actually being a, a champions of open source for many, many years. Actually, <laughs> um, as I started uh, over two decades ago, I started uh, 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 contributing to some of the open source projects like Kerberos. Um, so. Um, so we do have an office that actually streamlined the process of uh, uh, open sourcing, and we embrace the uh, 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 the, the Apache uh, version two uh, license um, because it's very permissive. Um, we have over 100 JPL DevOps software is now out in the open. Uh, not everyone is an Apache project, uh, but they all is available open source for anybody to download. Um, this is actually my trophy, right? This is just some of my trophy. Actually, I've been open sourcing software again for a long time now. Um, and it's just a simple email I got from our uh, technology transfer office, right? And, and this is something that I actually frame on my, the outside my office. Um, and it's, this is a scoreboard that say, hey, this is uh, uh, things that have been proved and means that I can actually take this out and I can actually make it available to the public. Um, and if you're interested, you can also find a collection of a NASA open source project uh, due to the software that NASA like Gov. Um, building this is cool, right? We say we all try to build some technology ways to try to put everything into uh, uh, some common solutions uh, and then have all the data in one place, uh, one big cloud. Um, that's just not going to work with Earth science, right? Uh, I just showed you we in the petabyte scale missions now. Um, and it's just not feasible to think about putting all the data in one place, right? Um, and, and, you know, because when is the cost? Second is that you don't have the domain expert to support all this uh, different parameters. Uh, so, you know, we should be moving to this direction, try to build this castle is, is going to fail, right? So what we have started this year, uh, actually early this year, is like, no, why don't we build a community of these services that, Giving them available uh, have access to you know uh, deploying uh, different instance of SDAP, one you know um, um, so that they have the domain experts how to manage the data the services they know how to do analysis on the data, and then all we need to do as user just in call these APIs and then uh, compare them uh, rather than have rather than having all the data into one place, and that's essentially what we have done. So over the last few years, we established a you know. Um, six different uh, SDAP instances across the globe. Um, and this is an ex example of that. We built this, we run this in Jupyter Notebook, where we're comparing analysis from the sea level change portal from NASA. Uh, and then from another project called the ECHO, uh, it's not a NASA funded project, but it's a completely different funding source, right? Um, we were able to do this on Jupyter Notebook without having to move any data between the system, right? We just use comparison on them. And the bottom one's the same thing, where we comparing the Grace follow-on mission, uh, which is uh, for measure for measurement for gravity, uh, with ocean bottom pressure data from another system, right? The cool thing about this is that I don't have to replicate these stuff all over the place anymore. I just call this API and says I know they're there, and they pay for the computation. I don't pay for it, um, but they. The whole idea here is though, because the way how the software is uh, configured is that. This, the, the operator of the system know exactly what's the growth rate. So they know exactly how much it's gonna cost them. Uh, so it's not like out of scaling and all of a sudden you just find yourself, you run, it, run out of money, right? So um, so we have a community of this service uh, system now and the, the current effort is moving into a, a wider global scale. So one of the effort that we're involving in is the uh, community on Earth observing satellite, really bridging different archive for different agency together. And we are working on infusing um, the SDAP over at the uh, uh, UMass site, which is in Germany, uh, that we can compare data between NASA and, and, the, uh, uh, and the ESA data interactively, which we have done before. We demonstrate that works. So now they are, we're working on getting this up and running. This is a, it's a private cloud environment. They don't run on Amazon. It's a very uh, customized environment. Whereas the NASA version is actually runs on Amazon, but again, because it's everything based on APIs, is completely hidden uh, to the user who built these applications. Um, so we also created a plugin where we can use S3 uh, to connect to SDAP instance. So this is actually an example where we can pull having an S3 uh, 
software talking to different uh, like center or app uh, where we can do interactively compare the data. Uh, if you don't know about Esri, is a, is a for-profit organization, right? They, you know, they're actually uh, the leader in doing GIS work. It's also proprietary solutions. Uh, so sometimes it's very challenging to move all the NASA free and open data to uh, a proprietary solution and justify, you know, what's the long-term cost of this thing. Well, we, with this solution, you don't have to because SDAP is free, right? Uh, so we have a service that actually runs in different archive center. Uh, and then you have a plugin that runs on the ArcGIS where they that allows the user of ArcGIS can talk to these instances and still get the same NASA data uh, uh, analysis we spawn. But not only that, they because they're in ArcGIS now, they can overlay their own favorite maps or their other analysis. They can even compare that with the NASA data, right? So this plugin is also available through the uh, the Apache, Apache software um, uh, distributions. Um, no data downloads, no data wrangling means like for projections, subsettings, and all that stuff, or you know, uh, and it's all just simple RESTful APIs. So building the community is actually uh, what I enjoy doing uh, be, uh, because uh, I get to meet different people, different scientists. You get to um, learning about their pain. Um, and we host different kinds of uh, hands-on uh, workshops, right? This is actually one of them we, we host about two years ago at, the, uh, at one of the uh, conference, uh, was a full house event uh, where people get their own AWS instance and they get to launch their own Jupyter notebook. They get to do interactive analysis. They get to do all that in less than two hours. So that was pretty cool. Um, and then we actually go off and uh, present at events, all right? This is one of the recent events I presented at the, uh, the Ocean Sciences meeting. Um, but we're also meeting with um, our uh, science um, uh, partners. Um, the whole idea is to figure out, well, what, are they, what do they need, right? You don't want to just build something and say, hey, you know, this is cool, take it, right? Uh, you really want to see, well, am I solving the right problem? Um, I also, also like this picture a lot. And, um, and the one of the reason for that is if you, this actually represents three um, uh, people from different disciplines. Uh, the gentleman on the far is he's a project scientist, okay. And the gentleman uh, uh, closer here, he's a uh, system architect. And um, the young lady right in the middle, she's a software engineer, right? So they all work together. This is actually what I call the dream team. They can actually come together. They they're looking at the uh, same analysis, and they actually can say, hey, what can we do with the system, uh, with this uh, data that we, we now we can easily slice and dice them, um, right? So um, again, the, we're not just building this in JPL. Uh, this, we do have a growing community, and this is actually, like, uh, uh, I'm keeping track of a list of people um, have been supporting us over the last uh, um, you know, four or five years, uh, actually more than that. Um, and uh, they are some of them uh, contribute lots of source codes. Uh, some contribute uh, scientific ideas and and uh, uh, giving us guidance in terms of the uh, 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 expertise in terms of how to work with the data that they have. And some is just basically uh, giving us the technology recommendations. So, uh, in summary, um, this is actually um, you know what I'm a big fan of uh, Future Shark, right? The book and really. When we we don't just want to build one little thing, say, hey, this is really cool. We want to start building these uh, system where it, we are building block to the bigger system. So um, this is something that I'm teaching my engineer to making sure to see a bigger picture of this instead of just say one little uh, nugget. Um, climate research is a big data challenge, right? Uh, you don't want to think about putting all the data in one place. You really want to create a community of this open source solution where they support different disciplines, where you can easily compare and uh, the analysis without having to move data across the wires. Um, but because of the big data, it has to be sustainable, it has to be uh, uh, automated. And um, we really focus on building the uh, open source. Uh, uh, it's not a final thing, it's like once you build it, okay, dump it. It's really when you when we start the project, we already think about let's make it open source uh, because we really hate to see a lot of stovepipe solution out there. At least we, once we make the software available to the public, uh, like a European partner, right? Um, now they're willing to be really more open to discuss because there's like, oh, NASA owned this stuff or JPL owned this thing or Thomas owned this stuff. 
um, but it's really you no know, Apache owns this stuff, right? So uh, the conversation is much different uh, once you uh, moved into that. Uh, when we're building architecture, we are also looking at generalization from specialization, right? We don't believe in creating a, 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 a basic a recreating like a, a technology just because you want to make it more portable. Like, you know, like who would want to reinvent Lambda, right? If it's already Lambda on Amazon, right? So you want to create, create generalization, which is the API level. And then you have the specialization means you want to take advantage of the hosting environment so that you can manage the cost uh, much more intelligently. So um and again uh, you know it's been very fun uh you know uh, i think the uh, apache uh, staff has actually been uh, making great impact across uh, nasa and across the uh, our international uh, partners uh, and i think uh, open source moving it uh, to open source is actually is the the best thing because uh, you know we actually allow people to uh, contribute and evolve the technology rather than you know uh, pointing to one person or one organization. And these are the two big missions that we're flying. One is uh, uh, lower right uh, is actually will be launched next year. Uh, uh, expect to generate about 23 petabyte of data. Um, and the one on the up is actually will be the year follow. Uh, again, this is massive petabyte scale missions. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, this, you know, if you have a question, feel free to email me. And I Thank you so much, Thomas, yeah. for, for your presentation. And uh, I would I would love to uh, chat more with you about this, but we have to move right on to the next the next uh, keynote this morning. But uh, I hope to catch up with you some more about this afterwards. Thank you again. Right.